Hello there and welcome back to Salt and Sanctuary. Today we're going to be continuing with making progress through the game, but first a little bit of gear alteration. Lightening up our equip load so we have the second best role in the game, trust me it'll come in handy in the future. As well as equipping the Saber Charm to our sword here which leeches focus, so that way we can restore focus that we lose by casting our magic, since we're still going to be going pretty heavily into that and then just a general clearing up of uh, inventory quick item slots, just so that way it takes less time to scroll to the stuff that we need to use. Now the sword that we're going to be using today is not going to be the branding iron that we used last time. No, instead we're going to be transmuting it to a new sword. Yet another magic one. Not the Lowlander's Great Knife, not the Tachi, but the Shike Maru. Probably one of the better mage weapons in the game even if it does require level 4 swords. It's one of the stronger weapons and it has the unique property of slide, which means that every single attack carries you forward further than that of weapons without that slide property. So it's useful for spamming attacks and chasing after enemies that try and get away. Now of course, we're going to want our gear to be as strong as possible, so let's get that Shigemo upgraded twice more since thankfully we do have the materials to do so, and we're not likely to use them on much else. There we go, now we have a truly powerful magic sword. But our weapon is not the only thing that we're going to be upgrading here. No, instead we're actually going to be doing something that we have yet to do a single time before in the course of this LP, and upgrade our armor. I will be speeding through this because uh, this takes quite a while. I think it took around like two and a half minutes unsped up. So upgrading armor in this is a bit interesting in that when you first do it, it doesn't seem like it's all that worthwhile since it does cost rare upgrade materials as well as a fair amount of salt. But as you continue to upgrade the gear, the bonuses to the defense get better and better. And if you have a piece of armor maxed out at plus 7, it ends up being roughly twice as good as it was at base. And in the case of this armor set in particular, it results in an overall 10-15% to increase to each of its defensive types. And that is a pretty significant boost, and one that will certainly be coming in handy against the boss that we're going to be fighting very soon. Siam Lake is much like Kran's Pass in that it is home only to a boss and is not really much of an area aside from that fact. Also we're leveling up a little bit here, primarily for the endurance, so that way regardless of which weapon set we're using, we're always under 50% equip weight. Oddly enough our staff actually ends up being heavier than the sword that we're using. So this upcoming boss is rather infamous as these messages somewhat indicate. There is usually quite a bit more outside of this candelabra here usually warning you or telling you of that player's woe. So what makes this boss so difficult? You know what? I don't think I need to explain. I think just showing you that will work wonders. A picture is worth a thousand words after all. And that's why she's so infamous. She is, bar none, the strongest boss in the game in terms of pure damage output. Now, as appropriate of a mage like that, she is quite squishy as well. Even without our flasks of defilement, we were doing quite a bit of damage to her health. And with them, we got her down to around half very quickly indeed. But if you make even a single mistake in this fight with regards to dodging or positioning yourself correctly so that you're actually able to dodge through her attacks, then you're going to be going down very, very quickly. So in addition to her magic, she also has this melee attack which really isn't all that threatening. It still ends up doing a lot of damage, but it can't really combo you as if it does hit you, it ends up knocking you away. Otherwise, her only other move is this Pursuers-like spell, which is probably her easiest to dodge magic attack. So yeah, you could probably think of this fight like the Mad Alchemist one on steroids. 
If you manage to keep your cool and do the necessary actions, the fight goes very smoothly and takes no time at all. But if you screw up even once, you're dead. And for that reason, while a lot of people find this fight distasteful, I like it quite a bit indeed. Especially since the boss run is pretty much non-existent. I'm just a fan of Rocket Tag, you know? If, however, you're not a very big fan of that type of boss fight, then be at ease. Because that is the last boss fight that is of that type for the rest of the game. So, proceeding past Siam Lake, we come to yet another new area, the Salt Alchemancery. Which is easily one of my favorite areas in the game in terms of aesthetic design. It's pretty much like a mad scientist laboratory, albeit a bit more old-fashioned, so perhaps a mad alchemist laboratory? Eh? Yeah, eh? Yeah. But yeah, despite the fact that this is one of the least colorful areas in the game and far and away one of the most washed out, it still ends up looking really cool to me. Now, in terms of gameplay, I'm not going to say that I dislike it, but I will say that it is home to some of the most annoying enemy types in the game. The only way it could be even better in that regard is if it had a few of the spindle beasts around, which very thankfully it does not. But yeah, the enemies you fight here tend to be some of the more difficult ones to deal with in the game, the saltless being the least of your worries. So it's not a bad idea to leave plenty of stone idols here to give you all the boosts possible. Increased efficacy of your magic and magic resistance in particular are really nice here. Ranged magic is a great way for dealing with a lot of the more annoying enemies and I'm not saying that the boss of this uses magic, but the boss of this may be using magic, so having increased magic resistance is definitely a plus. So, moving to an unrelated topic, earlier I said that the one-handed sword moveset is far and away superior to the two-handed sword moveset, and for the most part I stick by that opinion. It's just overall faster and that is the most important thing in most instances in this game. But the two-handed moveset does have one thing going for it and that is its heavy heavy combo, which is a thrust followed by a slower slash that sends any lighter enemy flying. It is just the thing for dealing with these bola eyes and their rather annoying command grab here. Ah, uh, so satisfying. But yeah, one-handed moveset overall better, but the two-handed moveset certainly has its charms. Sadly, neither are especially great at dealing with these annoying-ass tainted knights. Parrying, of course, completely chumps them, but if you can't lend the timing, you're gonna have a rough time. To be honest, I'm not entirely sure if that one attack of theirs is even parryable. The one where they do an extra slow thrust that then knocks you backwards. At the very least, I don't think I've ever managed the timing. Thankfully, the other thrust attack is plenty parryable, and dealing with this Tainted Knight in particular gives us the Asta Monolith as a reward. A rather nifty axe, yet another one of the weapons designed for mages, as most of its damage is elemental and skills with magic. We're not going to be using it here since we don't quite have the skills and swords are pretty much superior to axes in every way. But if you're an axe-loving mage, this might be just the thing for you. Although the joke is kind of on you because four out of the next seven bosses are quite resistant to lightning, its elemental damage type. So giving it to you at this point is kind of a little bit of a dick move. Anyway, here we come to yet another shortcut leading back to the Red Hall of Cages. Rather appropriate that two of the most aesthetically distinct areas are so close together. If you wanted to, you could probably extract implications that maybe they're so close together because they share a common purpose. One holds prisoners in an endless, torturous purgatory, while the other acts as their effective executioner by turning them into all sorts of horrible, ghastly monsters. Eh, I'm probably just reading into it a little bit too much. That pickup there, by the way, was just a salt pouch because it also had a spell that we have already obtained through other means. It is Static Geist. Also, uh, referring back to earlier as far as dick moves in terms of game design go, this is pretty high on the list. 
platforms that only become solid as you approach them and that are spaced out just far enough that if you're not exact with your positioning, you'll end up failing to grip the next one and fall to your death. Yeah, the devs really like being assholes with their level design when it comes to the completely optional secret stuff. Very uh, old school in that regard, I suppose. However, despite this being an entirely optional secret, it's something that you really don't want to miss because it actually imparts a little bit of story. So this armor set here, the Aristocrat set, may look familiar to you, at least if you have an eidetic memory. This is one of the very first armor sets that we've seen in the game after all, as it was what our princess that we were supposed to be guarding on the ship was wearing. And now I guess we know her ultimate fate eaten by a mimic in the Salt Alchemancery. It's just rather interesting that something that is supposed to be your character's ultimate goal, finding the princess that you were supposed to guard, just ends up being in an optional out-of-the-way area that is very, very easy to miss. I suppose in that way it does show the princess's ultimate importance to your character, which is to say none, since she was, after all, a red herring quite possibly a slave, much like the despondent thief's nobleman that she was supposed to guard. Or perhaps not, given the other item that we found among her clothes was a king's orders, and what would a mere slave acting as a decoy be doing with the orders of a king? Regardless of how you want to interpret it, one thing that I do want to explicitly point out here is that it is an instance of environmental storytelling that gives you multiple ways to interpret it. And that's something that this game is surprisingly lacking in, despite the major Dark Souls influences. Also, uh, just a quick shout out to good old Minty Skell, who we saw as we tumbled past that rather crazy wind tunnel, I guess you'd call them. But yeah, getting back to what I was discussing, it's interesting to note how there is almost a complete lack of real story in this game. There's plenty of lore, plenty of background details on all the various monsters and bosses that you're fighting that you can read up on via the bestiary. Still gonna show that off by the way, in the item descriptions, but without a real plot for these lore bits to hook onto, they end up being mostly meaningless. Lore is great for expanding upon things, but is pretty much completely worthless if it's just by its lonesome. Something that the actual Dark Souls games understand quite well, but which this one did not, sadly. Oh yeah, the uh, dancing ring gives you more slashing defense, so not terribly worth equipping. I uh, should bring up that that whole plot versus lore thing was actually brought to my attention by Highwing's LP of this game an or-only challenge run which I strongly recommend checking out just because his LPs tend to be very entertaining. But yeah, it was him bringing that up that really allowed me to put a name to the face of the issue I was having with the lore of this game. I've mentioned many times before that for the most part it doesn't really interest me all that much and that's because it, again, is kind of meaningless. You're wandering around a whole bunch of cool areas with cool monsters and bosses, but without really any reason as to why you should be doing so. I mean, technically you're looking for your princess, but that is such a vague, ephemeral goal that it doesn't really mean that much. I mean, let's compare it to, say, Dark Souls and Bloodborne. Dark Souls, you have the explicit goals of finding the Bells of Awakening so that you may learn the truth about the Curse of the Undead something that your character and many other people besides are actually inflicted with. And thus you have an actual character reason that you're wandering all over the place and checking out these cool areas so that you can find these bells and actually gain some insight into the world. In Bloodborne, on the other hand, you have a very ephemeral, vague goal, much like this game, to find Pale Blood to transcend the hunt, whatever the hell that means but very quickly you get introduced to other things that end up hooking onto you, the general mystery of Yanam, its hatred of outsiders, all the crazy shit that they do with blood, all the healing stuff, and so on. And in that regard, the game manages to hook you and again, give you a reason that you're exploring all over the place. And then you have this game, which doesn't manage to do either of those things and pretty much doesn't give you any reason to play it other than to play it. 
very gamey in that sense. Normally, I don't consider that to be at all a negative thing. Games are games, after all, and they are primarily to be played like the games that they are. But when you're talking about a game that is so strongly influenced by a series that tries and for the most part succeeds to be more than just that, it ends up being a little bit disappointing. Wow, that diatribe was way lengthier than I expected it to be at the start. So, uh, ignoring this sagnog like dude there at the bottom for the moment, uh, I do want to mention two things that I kind of glossed over while discussing that. The first being an item that we picked up, the Purina Scutum, a great shield with a very high amount of arcane resistance. I'm betting that if you upgraded it a few times, it would have 100% arcane resistance. And it figures that they give you a shield like that in the area after the annoying ass arcane damage dealing mage boss. The second was that the whole goal of that section of the level was to unlock a shortcut to this second section here, thus allowing you to go back to the sanctuary and heal up and then tackle the rest of the level with full supplies. Which I highly recommend doing because Sagnag over here is a really annoying enemy to deal with. In fact, in general, I'd recommend kind of just ignoring him if you don't have a way to cheese him like we do here. That rolling spin attack is nigh impossible to avoid if you don't have a wall in between you and him. And he is just a mountain of HP, even with the Flask of Defilement debuff and some powerful dark magic, he still takes a while to go down. But go down he does, and the reward isn't terribly worth it. Some mid-tier upgrade materials really weren't worth expending that effort, and we had to expend less than you typically do thanks to us being able to cheese him. So generally I would just recommend skipping that section entirely. Unless you need those materials to upgrade one of your weapons or armor pieces of course, then well, good luck. Here we come to the final segment of the area, and you could just head on straight to the boss. It's over on the left there, but we're going to go to a little optional bit over to the right here. There are quite a few bits of treasure that are guarded by some rather annoying to deal with enemies, one of these tainted knights to start you off with. Thankfully our potent magic makes this kind of a cakewalk even with my inability to reliably parry him as of late. With the Flasks of Defilement, we're actually doing pretty good damage with our magic even through his shield. Yet another reason why that is a superior item to the Golden Wine, in my opinion, despite them both being very, very good. Debuffing enemy defenses in general just means that you're going to do more damage to them regardless of what you're using. Whereas the Golden Wine merely buffs your attack and defense, so you have to be hitting them with a weapon for it to really count. Surprisingly enough, this chest here is not a mimic, and it contains the last two pieces of the Tainted set. So now you could cosplay as one of those Tainted Knights if you so felt like it. Heading further to the right there, there is more treasure, but it is guarded by an even more annoying enemy who we're just kind of going to go past, with his permission really, since he rolled right on past us. And right on into a secret of a type that we haven't seen since we were in the Watching Woods way back when, where you can end up jumping up into the environment into a secret room. Again, the reward is pretty much completely worthless for us since we have no need of these frozen upgrade materials, but this is one of the few places you can acquire a frozen tome, so this is highly useful indeed, especially if you didn't manage to follow the Despondent Thief's quest. The main reason though to bother trekking back all of this way is to unlock a somewhat useful shortcut. This one ends up leading back to the Siam Lake Sanctuary and gives us a ring as a reward in case the shortcut is not useful to us. The Ring of Meditation is a very good ring, reducing the focus cost of prayers much like the ring we have currently equipped that reduces the focus cost of magic. Sadly, you can't really make use of it to make an offensive focused prayer build because there really aren't many offensive prayers. In fact, I think there's a grand total of two. One that is a copy of the spell that the royal court sorcerers used, the one that causes pillars of light to spawn up from the ground. 
And that one isn't too very powerful from what I remember. The other makes it so that whenever you attack an enemy, there is a chance that a Sword of Light will spawn and attack the enemy as well. And while that's good for adding damage, it's not really quite the same as most of the mage offensive spells. But that aside, we finally got into the boss here. Say hello to the unskinned and his little lady friend up at his shoulder there. She's the architect and lore-wise, she is the one that we can blame for all of the annoying enemies that we've been fighting. The Heart Seekers, the Bola Eyes, the Spindle Beasts, and the Saltless were all her creations. As is this tall boy who is missing his skin. So this is the kind of dual boss encounter where each boss is distinct and complements the other. One is a big melee attacker who is overall aggressive and rushes after you, while the other is a mage who stays back and harries you with spells from a distance. Rather than shooting out projectiles like her sister, the Witch of the Lake, she instead spawns essentially mines that explode after a few seconds. So basically you want to avoid anywhere where there are those white circles. Now this is not a boss that I would consider to be at all difficult and yet somehow I managed to die here. And though the second attempt does not result in a death, it doesn't go that much more smoothly. Like, I think this might be the actual first time I've ever died to this boss. But that's enough about my personal failures, so the way that you want to deal with this fight is to focus on one of them, whichever one depends on what build you're currently rocking, and take them down ASAP. And then you can finish off the remaining one with relative ease. In our case, the architect ends up going down a fair bit more easily, even though she has fairly high elemental resistances across the board, she is quite weak to arcane. But with how aggressive he is, the unskinned is a better target for your first takedown if you're a more melee focused build, since he's always going to be rushing at you anyway. However you choose to handle this fight, as long as you manage to keep your cool, it shouldn't trouble you too much. It's certainly no Ornstein and Smoth, that's for damn sure. You know, having said that, I'm really disappointed that this boss fight does not take a specific cue from that one, and have the remaining boss get superpowers from whichever one you took down first. That would certainly be a way of making this fight a lot more standout and more challenging. But if nothing else, it is fairly novel for this game since there really aren't many multi-person boss fights. And that's the Salt Alchemancery done with. We enter the Crypt of the Dead Gods and encounter our good old friend. It persists and persists, but for what? Survival or Dominion? It can flee and survive. Or it can remain and claim rule. It will find both of these feats impossible. What does it strive for then? Survival or dominion? So are we a sub or a dom? Hard choices. But it should be obvious what we will have picked. This island is my domain. Those who wish to flee must earn their escape. This is impossible. It will discover this. What stands before it is a puppet. The puppet is my voice. Find me. And that's the last we'll be hearing from our scarecrow friend. The next time we meet, it will be face to face. But we're going to have to manage to survive until then, which can be rather difficult thanks to this enemy type here. I'm sure I'll be bemoaning them a plenty the next time, so I'll save that for then. But let me just say that they're a rather difficult enemy type to deal with. I made that one look like a chump, but don't underestimate them, or they will kill you very quickly. But that's enough for now, so let's claim our final sanctuary and rest.